Hi, everybody. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the confessions of the defendant, Richard Allen. And literally, they're not to be believed. Hi, everybody. Happy Halloween. I didn't know where my grandma witch t-shirt is. Probably in the laundry. <laughs> so we're wearing pumpkins today. And my sister's still in the hospital. So I'm going to take her little, uh, she bought like a little Halloween outfit. I'm going to take that to her. Oh, I want to get it out. So I don't forget. Hold on. That's right here. She got her cape. I should put the cape on. No. Anyway, it's hers. Um, <laughs> Welcome back to the show. I'm Rebecca. This is Crafting and Crime Daily, the show where I recap live trials, except this one's not live. You're not going to find this anywhere on YouTube or anywhere else. There's no audio. There's no video. And I would, oh man, I wish I was in that courtroom, uh, especially for this testimony that we're going to talk about today, because my understanding is that the defense cross-examination was brilliant. Um, but what I'm going to tell you today is very, very disturbing. Um, the fact that, I mean, this is the United States. Why are we doing this to someone? I mean, what is going on up there in Indiana? And I think there are eyes on it at this point because well, first of all, Nancy Grace showed up. <laughs> Good old Nancy Grace. Um, and my, my understanding is she, someone watched her show and she's sort of pro uh, convicting Richard Allen. And but but without all the facts, you know, and, and I, this is this is what I don't like about this woman. You know, it's she's very opinionated and usually doesn't have facts to back up those opinions. Um, but in any case, that's that's just my opinion, which I have no facts to back up. Anyway, don't sue me, Nancy Grace, please don't sue me. OK, so she's present in the courtroom. They made, you know, one they made room for Nancy Grace. Yes. She probably did not have to stand in line like everybody else. But in any case, um, so apparently in the courtroom, towards the back of the courtroom, there's a table. There's been a table all along that nobody's sitting at. But on this particular day, someone was sitting there, several someones who were dressed and looked just like some lawyers. And come to find out one of them was from the attorney general's office. So, and I suspect it's because the, uh, Next, several witnesses were Department of Corrections employees, and they are covering their butts about this one. So the person on the stand is Dr. Monica Walla. Now, the afternoon of the day before, I haven't told you about yet. It was a, it was a bunch of employees from the Correctional Institute. It's called Westfield. Uh, this is a maximum security prison. This is where, like, the worst of the worst go there. The, 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 you know, rapists, murderers, this is where they send them after they have been convicted. And if you act out while you're a prisoner in this maximum security, now you really are the worst of the worst. You get put into solitary confinement, which is an eight by 10, is it eight by 10? An eight by 10 cell that has a metal bed that is bolted to the floor it's uh, four or five inches off the floor. You get a four to five inch mattress for your comfort. There's no television. There's no desk. Uh, there is a toilet that is where your head should be. Or, you know, right near your head. Isn't that pleasant? There's a slit of a window 
with a view of some barbed wire. And that is partially obstructed anyway. And that's where you stay if you act out as a maximum security prisoner for a day, maybe a week maximum. Maximum. Yeah. Then you go back into general population. Two pods that have, you know, about 80 people per pod. And you get to have lunch with those people. You know, you, you, meet, you have meals with those people. You have recreation with those people. You have television. You have a bathroom where the door closes. These are the murderers, the rapists. Yeah. Not Richard Allen. No. So the first person on the stand, Dr. Monica Wallace, she is a clinical psychologist that was called in because of some very, very bizarre behavior uh, exhibited by Richard Allen. Richard Allen was ordered to be safeguarded while he was being held waiting for trial. So to them, that meant transfer him to prison. And he was transferred to this maximum security prison put in this solitary confinement, the hole, put in the hole for 13 months. 13 months. This is torture, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and let me tell you this. You have a camera that is watching you 24-7. You have lights that never go off. According to the warden, you can dim them a little bit, but the lights never go off. Let me tell you about the warden first, because he's a piece of work. Yeah, I, I, I just wish I could have been present or seen this testimony, because it's just so unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Let me find it. Oh, you don't get your regular clothes. You're wearing a gown. But he had three changes of clothes. He had gowns, three gowns that he could wear for 13 months. He was allowed out every day for recreation, except Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, Tuesdays, something like that, except two days a week. But the recreation for person in solitary con confinement is just a larger room with a cage but it's outside and you get fresh air there's like a basketball hoop there you're not there with anybody else there's a basketball hoop and there's a pull-up bar Woohoo! yes however he was given a tablet so you know he could play uh candy crush you know for 13 months all right where uh where is this interview with Okay. His name was John Gallico. He was the warden. All right. So he was in a 12 by 8 room. I, I think I might have said 10. I gave the wrong measurements. 12 by 8. But that, if you measure your bedroom, it's I guarantee you it's larger than that. 12 by 8. 12 by 8 would be like a mobile home bedroom. You know, those little mobile home bedrooms. Yeah. Something like that. Um, this was considered an observation cell. Um, he was placed on, everybody's using the term unalive. Unalive. Why can't you say suicide? He was on suicide watch. Now, if I get in trouble from YouTube, I'll know why they're not saying it. But that's what was going on. As are mo most pr people, when they're convicted or even sometimes when they're initially arrested, like Donna Adelson, for the first 30 days, you're on suicide watch. It's it's a normal practice. Some more, some less, you know, uh, depending on, you know, if you had any indication that you might harm yourself. In this case, I don't believe there was any indication that he ever gave that he was planning on harming himself. He got to shower three times a week. Woo boy. Yes. So the toilet was in his cell. He had three sets of 
gowns, these clothing. He had a tablet that he could download apps. Um, I could recommend some good games for him. Honestly, I could. And that would keep you keep you occupied for a little while. And you can make phone calls on the on the tablet. So during the 13 months that Mr. Allen was in this confinement, he got to see his family twice. Uh, his attorneys were allowed to visit him, but they didn't come often. Didn't come often. Uh, when he initially got there, he didn't even have an attorney. They had assigned him a public defender, um, but he he doesn't he didn't have the attorneys that he has now. The way it works is if you can't afford a lawyer, you get the public defender, and for these capital type cases, they'll eventually assign you a, a lawyer that's better equipped for, for the type of case that this is. And then he was watched constantly 24 seven by other inmates who were assigned the job of being his suicide companion, which means they would sit outside of the cell and they were given incentives to do this. They would sit outside of a cell and they just had to sit they had a log and they had to fill out the log if they're not, they weren't allowed to talk to him, not allowed to talk to him. But if he said or did anything strange, you put it in the log. Uh, so eventually it, it went from 24 seven to every 15 minutes. He had to be watched. And then over time, uh, the companions went away and he had guards. So for the first month or so that he's there, uh, it was, it was kind of quiet, no, nothing really going on. But then after he got some legal mail, and that's this is important, he was getting the discovery, copies of all the discovery, which would include descriptions of the crime scene, photographs, which would tell him what was going on at the crime scene, which is important. Because remember back when uh, we listened to opening statements or we got to hear about the opening statements, the prosecution had said he knew stuff only the killer would know. That's going to be very anticlimactic. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you up front. Very anticlimactic. Um, so as soon as he starts getting this legal mail, his behavior starts to change. He started becoming very emotional. He would rip up the mail. Um, he was just doing all this bizarre behavior, washing his face in the toilet, defecating in his cell. Um, while we're... There was other, other some of the officers that were watching him that said he was uh, eating his Bible. He asked for a Bible. He was eating the Bible. At one point, he tried to flush the Bible down the toilet, so they had to shut his water off. Um, he was using a fork on his genitals. I don't know why. Hot sauce, drinking hot sauce, drinking water out of the toilet, eating his own feces, sitting on the floor mumbling, lying in the bed naked, banging his head on the wall till his entire face was bruised. Yeah. And at no point did anyone think, you know, maybe he needs some uh, mental health care. I mean, they brought him a clinical psychologist, and I'm going to tell you what she had to say, but they didn't move him to a mental health hospital. They have facilities for people, for, for people that are awaiting trial. There are entire, they're not really, they're not called prisons, but they're, it's an entire facility where these people are had, are held until they 
there's two types that go there. Types that are declaring insanity, um, have been declared insane. They're not, um, they're not, oh God, I can't think today. Uh, not, they're not appropriate to stand trial. In other words, they don't understand the proceedings. So they stay there until it, they can become appropriate to stand trial in these facilities. I I had a job interview in once in one as a risk manager because with my legal background and my nursing background, I became a risk manager and I interviewed at one of these places and I was creeped out. <laughs> there was a guy, there was a guy that it was all male. It, there was a guy that kept swallowing his silverware and they would have to rush him to the hospital so he could get an endoscopy and they could get it out. Yeah, yeah, it was weird. I just said, you know, I don't think this is for me. No, I, I really don't think I'm the person for this job. It was out, it was in Florida. It was out in the middle of nowhere. Like just, I don't even think people in Florida know that this place is there. But instead of sending him somewhere where he could get help, they just left him there because some of the guards felt like he was being manipulative. Um, that they, they just weren't believing what they were seeing, I guess. I don't know. All right. So what else did the warden have to say? Washing his face in the toilet. I think I said that. So he sent a note to the warden on March 5th. Now he goes into this place. It was probably September, October of 2022. And he's there until November of 23. Um, he says, I, in the note, this was March 5th. I'm ready to confess to the deaths of Abby and Libby. I hope I can apologize to the families. Says he killed the girls with a box cutter that he stole from CVS and then disposed of it in a dumpster. But none of what he was saying is verifiable. They never found a box cutter in any dumpster. Um, I don't, we don't know if CVS even sells box cutters. Why would they sell box cutters? If you've ever bought a box cutter at CVS, let me know because that'd be interesting. So with respect to the, he was asked about this um, place where he was being held. It was built in 1996 and is scheduled to be torn down soon. It's no longer deemed an appropriate place to put anybody. Um, no longer deemed suitable for housing offenders. And this warden was very cocky, very, um, he's like, oh, it's suitable. <laughs> okay. Like he just wouldn't give every, anybody an inch. Um, but he, he was very unemotional during his testimony. Very, like he just didn't care. He just, didn't care about these people at all you know and my whole thought process was these people you know maybe this guy's guilty i don't know i'm starting to lean towards not guilty but you're supposed to be innocent until you're proven guilty in a court of law you're not this guy had been in the business for 28 years this warden five years of that prior to Mr. Allen getting to his facility as a warden and can't say that he'd ever seen someone that he'd ever housed someone waiting for trial in his facility, except for Richard Allen. So now the prosecutor kept objecting during all of this during all of this testimony and their basis for their <laughs> objections was that none of this is relevant the conditions of this westfield 
are not relevant. And the judge sustained that objection. Yep. This is very troubling. If you are not troubled by this, uh, then I want to know why, <laughs> because this is really troubling. The warden had no information that he was at risk for self-harm. In order to get his meals, he had they were put through a hole into his room. He could have movies and music uh, on his tablet if he paid for it. And at one point, he broke his tablet and went without one for a month or so. Then um, this warden acknowledged that if you do not follow orders, then the corrections officers are authorized to use force to get you under control if you don't follow orders. So there were a couple of times where Richard Allen had his hand on the door so they could not close it. And they used physical force to get his hand off the door. Actually, I'm sorry. They tased him. <laughs> that was the force that they used. They tased him to get his hand off the door. This is making me nauseous, honest to God, you guys. So um, going back to these companions that are, are inmates, not, in addition to not being able to talk to Richard Allen, they're not supposed to be able to, they're not supposed to go back to their cells and tell anybody else anything. So. None of these guards, once they switched to guards, had any mental health training. So he writes that letter in March of 2023. And then in April of 2023, all of those bizarre behaviors that I was outlining, that's really when it, it just goes off the rails. He's just way bizarre, way bizarre. Um, no one from the sheriff's office or the prosecutor's office came out there to see him. And um, after the 13 months, he was transferred to a facility called Wabash Valley. Now, I don't know why he was transferred. I don't know what kind of facility this was in Wash Wabash Valley. Um or if it was a prison or a jail. I have no idea. Nor I do I, we know where he is now. Um, I don't know that that was mentioned. Then, uh, towards the end of the <laughs> uh, warden's testimony, he was asked about being fired. And, of course, the prosecutor jumped up and objected, and that objection was sustained, you know, outside the scope. Uh, and the judge says, yep, it's outside the scope, but... So, because it's outside the scope of his direct examination, the defense can bring the warden back on their direct examination and ask him, why were you fired? I'd love to know. Were you fired? Why were you fired? Anyway. Now let's go back and talk to the, about the clinical psychologist who came in in April. So, uh, you know, when these behaviors started being exhibited. I have so many notes, my gosh. Um, hold on. <laughs> pages and pages here. All right, here we go. Nope, that's not even the beginning. Hold on. <laughs> he confesses several times to her.
Okay. I'm still not at the beginning. Guys, this, this went on for a while. All right. I, I'm going to try to not to give you the long version <laughs> that everything that I have in my notes. So she works for a company that has a contract with this correctional facility, a mental health company. Um, I don't know how often she saw him, but she said clearly he was having a mental breakdown. Clearly. Uh, he had been placed there for safekeeping. This is all things she said. This was a very restrictive uh, environment. Um, most of the things she says we already know. This is the most restrictive cell in the entire facility. She warned him as soon as she saw him, do not talk to anybody else about your case. Don't talk to anybody about your case. And there's a very interesting detail about this woman that I'm going to tell you before, before this ends. So don't go anywhere. He tells her, I killed Abby. This is on April 5th. I killed Abby and Libby. I did it on my own. He made sure they were dead. I'm trying to read my own writing. He made sure they were dead because he didn't want them to suffer. His intentions were sexual in nature. He thought they were older. He said he's been selfish all his life. He wants to apologize to the families. And he's been an alcoholic since 2011. But nothing specific about the crime there. On March 21st, he asked the doctor if she believed in God. He hoped everyone could find God before they died. He hoped the families could forgive. He would go back and undo his actions if he could. Still, nothing specific. She said he was acting pretty, you know, very, very religious, uh, drinking water out of the toilet, delirious from not eating. And when he got to see her, they would put, he would be shackled, you know, the waist shackles, the ankle shackles, and a thing around his neck, like a leash. And they would put him in this three by three cage that she could talk to him through. A cage. Um... She felt like he had a normal appearance. Sometimes he would stare intensely for a very long period of time. She admitted that his mental status was labile, which, which means basically all over the place. <laughs> sometimes you're okay, sometimes you're not. She said he would go off on tangents while he was talking to her. On May 2nd, he says, I killed Abby and Libby. I will kill everybody. Uh, I, he said he started World War. He's going to start World War III. He killed his entire family and his best friend. He would kill himself too, but he's too much of a coward. And she said he had difficulty staying on topic. At one point, he stopped up his toilet with the Bible. They had to cut off his water. So now, if he wanted something to drink, he had to ask for it. So there was a point where he was not eating and drinking. So I haven't described this man to you. When he was first arrested, he was sort of a portly guy. Five foot four, you know, had a little belly on him, you know. Now, he's like this skinny dude. This little, you know, if you've seen him come into court. So on February, and they were bouncing back and forth with this woman's testimony. They'd go to April, then they'd go back to, and then they'd go to November, and then back to April, and then back to November. Um, so he was saying that on the day of the murders, he saw his parents that morning. He was supposed to eat with them, but instead he went and bought a six pack and he only drank three of them. He bundled up, saw the girls, followed them to the bridge. He said he did something with the gun. You know, at this point, he did something with the gun that he thinks that's when the bullet fell out on the bridge. 
the bullet wasn't found on the bridge. He ordered them down the hill. And now keep in mind, he's seen the discovery. He knows all this. He knows about the video. He knows, he knows all this. I don't think he's seen the video, but he knows all this because it's in the discovery. Thought they were older. He saw a van and he was startled. Uh, his plan was to sexually assault them and he wanted to make sure they were dead. So he covered them with branches. And he did not follow through with the sexual assault. Instead, he murdered the girls, covered the girls with branches. He did not exit the trail. Or he didn't exit by the trail because he didn't want to be seen. And then he go, he managed to go on and continue with his life. The doctor said he appeared relieved after making this confession. He was concerned about not getting food or water and asked about a transfer to another facility. Does that tell you anything? Yeah. He said he was eating his own feces because he was afraid to tell the truth. He wanted his wife to know that he loved her if he died. And that he didn't want to miss Easter. <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, he says, the, the, the last time you see me, I'll be in the electric chair. I didn't do all I said I did, but I did kill Abby and Libby. Now, this doctor's conclusions was that he was, uh, his thinking was organized. He was coherent. He was not in psychosis at this point. What? <laughs> Excuse me? Says, I really just want closure. I want to apologize to the families. Wanted to see his wife. Then they jump. They jump ahead till August, and he's saying, "I want to go to. I want to go to heaven, talk to my wife, see my family." He feels like his heart is going to split. Fears something is happening to him, and he wants to say goodbye to his family. Was it? Um, at this point now, she's saying he's not really being rational. <laughs> he's very confused. Um, I want to let my wife go. I'm a burden. In November, he, she felt like he was gaming the system because you're in the system, in where he was, you're allowed to skip meals but if you skip more than four meals then they then they that's when you know you it, i don't know you're you're only allowed you're not allowed to skip four meals i don't know what happens if you skip the fourth meal so he would only skip three so this gave her the impression that he was gaming the system now we go back to april he's aware he confessed uh he was being more blatant about with his symptoms she thought he was feigning, in other words, faking it. But then at the end of her testimony, she said, you know, going back and rethinking this, I'm thinking he wasn't feigning. So she's reconsidered. Yes. So at one, paper, at one point, there were legal papers strewn all over his floor. And she admits she saw his behavior change after seeing the discovery. She said he would be naked. He'd be touching himself, banging, kicking the door, licking the camera, um, lying in his feces, eating feces, refusing medication to the point where they involuntarily gave him Haldol. Now they said this Haldol is supposed to last 30 days. I 
I was a nurse. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what they were giving him. That Haldol does not last 30 days. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know who told them that, but no. Just doesn't, unless there's something new out there. How does Haldol last 30 days? She felt like the breakdown was due to the discovery materials. He was getting little to no sleep. Um, she thought he was doing it to gain something. Yeah, he wanted to get the hell out of there. <laughs> of course he was doing it to gain something. He'd be wacky, then fine. Um, at one point, he said he fell asleep. And then when he woke up, there had been a nuclear war activated by his death. Sometimes he'd be singing, marching, crying. She said there was a little improvement after he took the medications, although he was still very sleep deprived. And his speech at this point, this is April 14th, was grossly disorganized. That's what we're dealing with here. She asked him, why aren't you taking care of yourself? I'm selfish. So let me tell you about this, this woman. <laughs> She's a true crime buff. She likes to listen to true crime podcasts. And she had been investigating this murder herself. And while she was there working, she had access and did access another prisoner's file by the name of Keegan Klein, who at one point had been a suspect in these murders. But he was there for something else. I, I don't know what he was there for. Um. She followed several podcasts. She contributed to those podcasts. She recommended those podcasts and would comment on those podcasts. I don't know what podcasts they were. Probably not mine. <laughs> but, um, but at some point, she shut all of her accounts down. Um, yeah. At, I guess when they found out. And then all of a sudden, she was not allowed to return to Westfield. I guess maybe they figured it all out and said, uh, hey, I think they figured out that she had accessed this other guy's records. But this is a huge conflict of interest. Huge. She should never have been on his case. Never. So his diagnosis was major depressive disorder. I'm just seeing if there's anything I missed telling you. Preoccupied, paranoid, stressed out. You know, even convicts, when they're convicted, they don't just put you in the, in the prison. You go to a facility for orientation. That's usually about 30 days. That's where they shave your head. They tell you all about prison. They teach you about the commissary, the phone calls, the recreation. They just put them put in solitary confinement for 13 months. Now, imagine yourself in this room with this bed, this metal bed, a four to five inch mattress lights are on constantly you have no idea what time of day it is you got to get your meals through a hole yeah all right guys it's all pretty disgusting so oh i forgot to mention the mo most important part the van the van that he saw so the guy named Weber that lived at the, the end of this access road. So it, when you go down the hill, you'll end up at an access road that ends in this man's driveway. His name is Weber. And at one point he was a suspect and his gun was tested and was inconclusive. 
that bullet might have come from his gun. But uh, they verified that he was working the day of the murder. He got off about 2.30, would have taken 20 to 30 minutes to get home. So they didn't think this was him. But he drove a van. So the video on the bridge was taken at 2.13 p.m. So if he is just leaving work at 2.30 and takes, the, you know, the 25 to 30 minutes to get home, that could match the time frame when these girls were murdered. So does this, any of this ring true? I don't know. The van. So this entire case rests on whether the jury believes the van. Okay. That's it for today. Uh, the prosecution is expected to rest their case today. Um, and then the defense will begin their portion of the case. So I will keep you posted. Uh, I am planning to do a an auction on Saturday. That's at 1 p.m. I'm going to be auctioning off some diamond paintings. I have way too much in my stash. Um, there's other paintings I would like to have. <laughs> um, so I am going to um, auction those off on Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, not going to tell you what the paintings are because, you know, then you may or may not show up. But and it'll be fun. I always have fun doing these auctions. So I've done so. I've helped other people out with their auctions, but now I'm going to have one of my own and raise a little bit of money. So um, I will see you guys in the next episode. Don't forget to like this video, uh, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.